Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome to our final session. We are so glad that you all have stuck with us today and attended our conference. Uh, we think you are in, I think you're in store for an amazing uh, final panel. I will be talking about healing today. Um, we have an amazing panel of experts who will be joining us and sharing in our conversation. So I just want to introduce them. Uh, introduce myself first. I am Dana Cunningham. I'm one of the vice presidents of Black Mental Wellness, and I'll be moderating this session today, again, focused on healing, which is such an important uh, component for us to talk about as we have navigated really unprecedented times over, certainly over the last two years, but even before that, we know, um, you know, we've had to rely on our healing strategies to get through some difficult moments. So I am excited about our panel. Um, first, I will introduce Meaty Bardinelli. Uh, Meaty is uh, a trained cardiac ICU nurse. Um, she is a health and wellness advocate, also a wife, mother, and as a nursing director of surgical oncology at MedStar Washington Hospital Center, she's worked on the front lines throughout this pandemic. So thank you for your service, Meaty. Um, in addition, she's as a nurse entrepreneur, Meaty is a principal managing partner of AFIA Wellness Solutions, whose mission is to engage, educate, and guide underserved communities and influence organizations to positively impact health outcomes and eliminate inequity. And Meaty also founded the Black Nurse Collective, a developing nonprofit, which aims to promote health and wellness in the Black community. So thank you, Meaty. And we also have Brennan Allen Steele, who is a believer, author, and educator. He's a graduate of Duke University and a formal, former middle school math teacher. He currently serves as a Dean of Social Emotional Learning at a local middle school in Memphis, Tennessee. In addition, his personal mental health journey made him passionate about the mental and emotional wellness of others, and particularly that of black men. And Brennan most recently published a journal entitled Breathe, a guiding healing journal for black men. So welcome, Brennan. And we also have Dr. Johnny Parker. Um, he is an executive coach and relationship architect. Dr. Johnny is an adjunct professor at Johns Hopkins University, where he teaches Introduction of Positive Psychology, which focuses on conditions leading to happiness and flourishing. Dr. Johnny uses his clinical background and research in positive psychology to help people revolutionize their relationships, work, and lives. He's also authored several books, including Turn the Page, Unlocking the Story Within You, Exceptional Living, 31 Exercises for Enriching Your Life, Work, and Relationships, Renovating Your Marriage Room by Room, and Faith Like a Child. So as you can see, we are in store for an amazing conversation. All right. So I want to just kind of start open up the conversation by talking about healing. So what does healing mean to you? Uh, Brennan, I'll start with you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it was really cool. Last year, I was a vendor uh, when I first published the journal. And so it's really exciting when this end to, to be on a panel. So thank you all for having me. Um, in terms of how I define healing, um, I think about healing um, as the pursuit of wholeness. Um, particularly in, in all ways. So I think about wholeness emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually. Um, I don't think it's healing in just one area. I think you're, you're, you're searching for wholeness um, in all aspects of your life. Um, I also think about it as um, like, the, like when we think about the theme of this conference, I think about it as overcoming. Uh, specifically, I think about um, overcoming uh, specific traumas that you have or like that you've experienced in in your life, your childhood, um, and uh, not only just figuring out how to navigate or deal with them, um, but actually like uh, moving, being able to address them, confront them so that you can move uh, beyond them. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a pretty goofy person. <laughs> and so I have a bunch of uh, scars all over my body um, from different accidents throughout childhood and, and adulthood, <laughs> to be honest. Um, and I continue to see them heal. Like you still have the scars, you still have mm. um, kind of scabs and things like that, but it's a continual journey um, as you pursue um, wholeness. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that thinking about wholeness because we can't just focus on one aspect of of our health and wellness journey. You know, a lot of times people say, oh, you know, I'm getting healthy and go to the gym. Yeah. But what are you doing with your mind? What are you doing with your spirit? How are you nurturing those other areas of your life? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we sometimes tend to focus on what's easiest um, and kind of go there in terms of thinking about our healing journey. But sometimes we do have to get those scabs and get those scars in order to grow. Um, and that's really important, too. So thank you for sharing your definition. All right, Meaty, what does healing mean to you? I, I'm sitting on the edge of my seat, Dana. I, I was so excited to hear my brother, uh, Brennan, talk about the scars and how um, even from his childhood, they're still healing and they still bring forth memories. And so for me, um, just to kind of add value to that, first, I want to thank you um, for having us and allowing us to share in your platform today. Mm -hmm. But I think the in an interesting thing about healing, and again, my brother, Brendan, um, set it up for myself and uh, Dr. Parker here, is that it's a process. It's a journey. And for me, it is about um, making or becoming sound and healthy again. And that is mind, body, and spirit. And I think um, the importance for all of us to remember is that healing is not just a once and done thing. Um, as a cardiac ICU nurse, as you said, I've cared for many patients who've had open heart surgery. They will forever have a scar in the middle of their chest yeah. where their chest was cracked open to truly heal and mend their heart. Now, yeah. as Brendan said, they are, they're better. They're living their best life. It could have been 10, mm. 15 years from there, but they will always see that scar that reminds them of that major surgery that they've gone to. And again, it's a process. So prayerfully and the hope as Brendan shared, that scar will remind them to eat healthy, to, to not be stressed, to do the exercise, to take the necessary medication if prescribed, and to do mm. all of those things to make sure that they can continue mm. uh, to live a full and healthy and meaningful life. And so I'm grateful uh, that Brendan went first so I can add that because I think he set it up um, impeccably for us to make sure, again, healing is a process. And it's about us truly, again, becoming whole. Um, and again, as you alluded to, Dana, not just healthy from a uh, physical perspective, but mind, body, and spirit. So thank you so much for that. And Brendan, thank you. <laughs> awesome. And I think it looks like we have our other panelists, David McCullough. Are you able to hear us? Yes. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So really quickly, I will tell you all a little bit about David. Um, he's the founder and CEO of Inception, um, which is the first mental health gym. Um, so I'm really interested in learning and hearing more from him about uh, uh, Inception and kind of what you do there and how you help support people. Um, but in addition to developing um, technology, David is in charge of designing a circuit model of training that addresses mental health in a comprehensive way. And Inception is leading the wellness industry by becoming a mental health enterprise and also making new contracts contributions to the field through experiential mental health gyms and home products, world-class inner fitness trainers, and ongoing educational experiences. So mm -hmm. we're glad you could be with us today, David. We are just getting started in our conversation about what healing means to you. Um, so um, I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Johnny Parker, and then uh, we'll hear from David. Well, for me, I totally concur with what Brennan has said and media has said. I'm thinking, I'm, I mean, they've answered it in so many ways. It's a journey. It's a process. I think the other thing I would add is that people who embrace the journey, who embrace the healing process, they take ownership for their life. I think that's a big, big deal. Functional, healthy people take responsibility for their dysfunctional ways. Dysfunctional people blame others for their dysfunctional ways. They don't own anything. I mean, that goes Bible 101. Adam, where are you? It's the woman you gave me. Really? You ain't going to own that, brother? You're going <laughs> to put that on the women? And poor sisters, y'all get it. Y'all, you know, anyway. We do. We do. But yeah, he, he, he's, he's out of control. I mean, he's blaming God. He's blaming the woman. And so there you go. So I think that's the, I think that's a big part of it is ownership in the healing process, because whatever a man or woman or a person doesn't own will own you. And mm -hmm. so the healing process is intentional. We don't bump into better. We don't wander to wellness. Healing happens intentionally. And, and it's, as it's been said, it's, it's a process and it is a journey. 
Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah, being intentional about our healing. We're so intentional about so many other things in our lives. You know, we have to go to work. So we get up, we, we make sure we do that. We want to get that check. Uh, you know, if there's other things, we have to take care of the kids. You know, we make sure they're taken care of. Um, but how are we being intentional regularly um, about our healing, you know, and not suffocating it, not pushing things to the side, not ignoring them, but being intentional uh, about our healing journey is so critical. Uh, all right, David. Let's get you in this conversation here. So what does healing mean to you? Well, again, I, I just timed in. So I, I just listened to everybody and everybody's saying the exact the same thing, uh, just through different vessels. And healing is a one for me. I look at healing as a, a systematic approach to loving yourself. Mm. You know, if, you, if you, you're not in the process of healing, you're in the process of what? Dying, right? So the more that, and even scientists are starting to understand that um, aging, they're going to consider aging as a uh, disease. But it really is. It's the inability to take in substances and to be able to use those substances to be able to create more life. So when we, we don't have that ability to do that anymore, then that's when we end up aging, right? So healing is a systematic approach to being able to um, survive the last threat survive the last trauma to be able to move forward and that's where a lot of us are kind of stuck in unresolved you know traumas that it's, it blocks us from being able to fully be expansive in who we are and our, our true vessels so i look at it from a, a total human being standpoint um i don't look at mental health a lot i know a lot of people think about mental health we look at it from here like this is this is my this is mental health here and mental health is all of who you are it's this vessel this is the temple so when we talk about church and everything, we're looking at buildings, but this is this right here. This is church. This is this is the temple. This is the vessel. So healing to me is me having awareness that on a day to day basis, I need to be totally uh, aware of what's going on inside here, because this is what creates the life. The life out here is not what creates it. Your emotions are created in your body. So. I think of the healing again. I look at it from all all the dominoes that go along with it, and along my journey, I've been finding that there are a lot more dominoes than you think. So tell us about those dominoes. So we, I know you do a lot of work in terms of, um, like you said, kind of really working on, you know, not just you know. A lot of times people will go to therapy, and and that can be really helpful. But I know you have a lot of other. Uh, practices that you incorporate as part of your work um, to really address some of those unresolved traumas and some of those issues that people are having a more difficult time uh, addressing. Right. Well, for me personally, I was dealing with anxiety and panic attacks and insomnia and depression. So all of those things, all of those system, uh, systems, symptoms that I'm experiencing, when you when you think about it, they're not symptoms. They're responses. Mm -hmm. Their responses to how my brain and my body is using its resources to protect me from threat. You know, we may not understand why the body is uh, doing what it's doing, but I know personally that the body is doing nothing but to help you to survive. You know, the body doesn't, the brain doesn't care if you can't sleep now per se, if you can't get into deep sleep, but are you alive? So we look at it from the standpoint, again, when we talk about the mind here. So if you close your eyes and you go into the kitchen of your, of your home and you take out a lemon and you bite into that lemon with your eyes closed, if you do that at home, why does your mouth start to salivate? Because the mind-body connection is real. Your mind can't distinguish between real and what's fake. It's the same way when we watch a movie and we jump, right? If we watch a scary movie, we jump. Why did the body jump? Because the body can't tell the difference between what's in here and what's out there, right? So when we look at it, we're talking about the body. Everything we keep talking about is the body. So we use tools that's going to help the body to come back into safety because that's all stress and trauma is. It's the brain and body not feeling safe. And when the brain and body doesn't feel safe, that's a dysregulated system. The dysregulated nervous system. Yes, the body keeps the score. Absolutely. So even uh, the, the the guy who created that book talks about using neurofeedback. Neurofeedback was one of the first tools that I ever used 15 years ago. So at Inception, we couple different types of tools like neurofeedback, like flotation therapy, like a magnetic therapy, and we're working. We're helping people go through boot camps to get the brain and the body 
to come back into its own safety within its own vessel so that when you go to therapy, now the therapist's job can be a lot easier with you because they're not trying to, uh, you know, uh, basically break through the gate to get what they need out of you. So when people come to inception, they use our tools, they coming out crying and they coming out, I call it verbally vomiting because it's like all this emotion is now starting to come up. So now you can go to that therapist and begin to process and go through that integration, you know, and that's, that's the harder part is the, the processing and the integrating of everything that's coming up. So, but we, we work to let the gates open and let you come back into safety. And then from there, your journey kind of starts. Yeah, thanks for, for sharing that, David. I think, you know, as you said, and, and what's been so so much uh, in the chat, people have been really agreeing with you, you know, just about how much the body keeps the score. And we know trauma lives in our bodies and we have to figure out how we're going to address that, how we're going to deal with that, or it's going to show up. Whether we want it to or not, it's going to show up in our actions with, with um, other people, with our family members, with our loved ones. Um, and so it's important to address that. So, um, so speaking of health, I want to um, talk to Meany. Uh, for a minute, uh, you know, you, you're a nurse on the front lines during the pandemic. Uh, one of the things that have really come up that we've heard a lot about are, you know, a lot of underlying conditions, you know, higher incidences of, um, you know, asthma, diabetes, heart disease in the black community. Um, and oftentimes people are saying, well, you know, what can we do as individuals to improve our health, which is important. We need to obviously take care of our bodies, but there are also some systemic things that are, are a part of our health and healthcare systems that need to be addressed as well. So it'd be interesting kind of hearing your perspectives about what can be done on both sides from the individual level as well as systemically um, to address some of these disparities and inequities. Dana, thank you so much for that excellent question. The first thing I will say is that um, health, um, and I and I quantify that meaning wellness, mind, body, and spirit, because as, as David and all of us have shared, it's not just your physical health. All of that is encompassing to who you are, um, is the greatest asset that you have. Again, health is the greatest wealth asset that you have. It doesn't matter how wealthy you are. It doesn't matter how famous you are. It doesn't matter what your uh, political position is. If you are not in a place, in a place where you're healthy, well, and whole, all the wonderful things that God has given you that he's created you to be cannot be manifested if you're not in a place and space to live out who your truth is. Um, and so with that, I start off by simply stating that it is so important for us as individuals to own your health. I was sitting here, if you saw me looking down, I was I was taking notes, even as Dr. Parker was talking about, you don't, you don't just bump into being healthy. You don't just jump into health. You just, these things don't just happen. There has to be an intentionality of care caring for yourself, um, quite frankly, more so than even the immediate people in your household. So often I remind people, think about what they tell you on the airplane, put your oxygen mask on first. Even if you have your child there, if you don't put your oxygen mask on yourself, you won't be able to do the things to care for that child that you love and you care for so dearly. You have to take care of yourself so you can be in the best place and position to care for those whom you love. And so with that, I encourage everybody to make sure you take, um, you know, the old saying goes an ounce of prevention um, goes a mile. And so it's so important to make sure that you do those regular checkups as much as you possibly can. Um, We've gone nearly two years um, in this pandemic. And so I wonder and uh, often question the people who have not yet had those mammograms. I've had two friends since the pandemic that has been diagnosed with breast cancer, two mm -hmm. already that I personally know that are close to me, not extension, two people that are close, near and dear to me. Um, I have a son, my own son, because of uh, dental delays, et cetera, who now had to have a cavity removed. Why? Because you have not gone to see a dentist in this long period of time. And so I share with people that it's so important for you to do those preventative things as much as you possibly can to care for yourself, uh, to get those colonoscopies, you know, my, my three brothers on here, to get the prostate checks done, to do all of those things to make sure that you are 
able to do the things that you have been called on this earth to do. As a system and as a society and collectively, I encourage all of us to make sure that we take care of each other, that we take care of ourselves, that you find it not robbery to go out there and, and schedule that 30 minutes a day, whether it's a walk, whether it's a jog, whether it's yoga, whether it's swimming, whether it's biking, whatever it is, you have to do and move your body. Um, I, I still believe it doesn't matter. I tell people you could be skinny fat just because you're a size two or a size four. Trust me, does not mean that you're a healthy. I've had, again, personal friend who's on blood pressure medicine and cholesterol medicine who literally is a size two literally size two, 52 year old woman. And so I tell people, it's not about a size. You have to be healthy and well. And then moreover, as my brother David just mentioned about just this, you have to understand when you are stressed, when you are not healing yourself from current past uh, trauma that you might have experienced and are actively living through, you have to understand how your body processes stress, which is cortisol. Cortisol is your stress hormone. And the more that you are under stress, that hormone continues to produce. The more that it produces, it impacts your liver. Literally, it impacts your liver. It therefore impacts your kidney. And you wonder why black and brown uh, people, specifically my African-American brothers and sisters, have a higher predisposition to diabetes and hypertension and all those other comorbidities that so unfortunately uh, we succumb to. And so for me, take care of yourself, take care of each other, make sure you do the exercise, schedule it just like you do your nails and your hair in the barbershop and everything else. Make sure you do that. And more importantly, for those that are in positions of, of authority or power or some type of place where you're in a workplace, make sure that you have um, you work, I hope, for a company, boss, or an organization that prioritizes your wellness. Because even from a corporate perspective, uh, the greatest asset that any organization has is their human resources. And so I encourage those people out there that are watching and listening as well, that if your workforce is not in a good mental place and space or healthy as well, that also therefore impacts your bottom line. So I, I like to come at it from several different uh, uh, points of view. So thank you so much for that question. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Um, again, it just really reminding us to be intentional, right, about our, our wellness journey. I think um, a lot of people really resonated with um, your comment, Dr. Johnny, earlier about we don't, you know, kind of bump into, uh, you know, wellness, right? We have to, to really take an active role in, in creating that. Uh, but speaking of that, um, Dr. Johnny, you have said um, that uh, you help people achieve success by viewing their lives as a story and you help them discover the story they were born to live. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, I think in story and I think everyone's life is always telling a story. Every man's life, every woman's life, every person's life is always telling a story. The question is, is your life telling a story that you wanted to tell, that you were born to tell? And oftentimes, I think David said it, we get stuck in a bad story. We get stuck in stuff in childhood. We get stuck in what we're going through right now. Um, in a pandemic. And now we're in a time of the year where we got, you know, we got the, we got the pandemic and we got holiday blues, family blues, winter blues, seasonal effective stuff. Uh, I don't feel like passing the cranberry sauce to uncle and auntie. I'm still mad at stuff that happened in things, you know, in childhood. So we got all, child, you know, all this stuff is gets unresolved. And so I talk about it in terms of a front stage and a backstage. Our front stage is our appearance. It's our work. It's productivity. It's social media. It's what many people call the grind. And um, and so you got this front stage and we, 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 we've always gone hard at the front stage. It's what people see. It's how you show up and how they see you. It's your front stage. Your backstage is your true self. It's the stuff. Um, it's, it's where the story is birth. And so the backstage, I have an acronym that I use to help people process their life as a story. And it's, it's story, S-T-O-R-Y. The S is your soul. Who am I? What do I want? Why do I want it? Who am I? That's talking about your identity. What do I want? That's talking about impact. No one wakes up in the morning thinking, ooh, how can I be average today? People want to have impact. And so then the I, then, then why do I want it? That's intent. It's what Simon Sinek says, know your why. And then that T is transparency. It's important that we understand our emotional intelligence. Over 90% of a person's success in life is based on their self-awareness, emotional intelligence empathy, transparency. 
And in my backstage for a long time, I relate very much what David said. I, I'm in the field and I wrestled with depression and panic attacks because here's what happened. In my backstage, I refused to give an access pass to people. I'm a dude from Brooklyn, New York. I grew up in the hood. We don't, you know, you talking about trauma. I grew up in trauma. And so I wasn't trying to let anyone in my backstage. My wife was trying, she was knocking on the door. I was like, baby, you can't come back here. I don't, I, you know, it's dark back here. I don't even know what's back here. And I don't want to be punked, right? I don't want to be lame. So I don't want her to see my stuff. And I'm going to tell you, there was a time in my life, I couldn't even go to the dentist without telling her, I need you to go because whenever I felt confined, I would have a panic attack. Mm. I, I, and, and so, um, so I, that's my story, but I had to get, learn how to be transparent. I needed to learn how to trust brothers like Brennan and David and let good men in my backstage. And, um, and, and, and so that's what I do. And, and, and I do it and, she, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm extremely vulnerable. I tell my story because I really want to help men and particularly black men, um, heal and, and, and move towards mental health and, and wellness. And so, uh, so that's that's the work that we do. We really help you get clear on 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 your story, uh, knowing it. OK, because if you don't know your story, what will happen is you will plagiarize someone else's life or someone else will write your story for you. Hmm. If you don't know it, if you don't know your story, someone else is going to write it for you. And, and oftentimes, sometimes it can be well-meaning people, but you got it. And, and so in order to know our story. We need a supporting cast. We need people who love us to help us in that story. And, and so many people, whether the story becomes one of drama, whether it's mystery. I mean, I'm a Jason Bourne dude. Jason Bourne taught most of Europe trying to figure out his identity. And, <laughs> and so, um, so this is the work that I do. And I do it with um, I, my wife and I do it with couples. We do it Fortune 500 companies. I work with NFL teams. You see some teams in the background. Um, and I, and you know, T-Mobile. And so we do it at a very high level and do we do it individually with, with leaders, men and women and, and couples. Yeah, I love that, Dr. Johnny, thinking about what is, um, you said so many things, they're all just going around in my head right now. Uh, but one is kind of like the backstage and the front stage, right? Like a lot of times we um, get stuck and caught up, I think, in what we want other people to see or what we think we, other people want to see. And so we get so caught up in that image and projecting something. It's not even our true selves, right? People get stuck in jobs that they don't like because they think they have to hold up, you know, an image and get stuck in relationships they don't want to be in because, um, you know, they think they're supposed to be in there because that's what their family has said, you know, that's who they're supposed to be with. Um, and so really being authentic, being vulnerable, being honest with yourself about, you know, who you are and what you need is so important. Um, and I think that kind of leads a little bit into uh, Brennan. Uh, I want to pull you in here because this I'm guessing, uh, you know, kind of thinking about men and brothers. You wrote this journal uh, really focused on black men to, to really help um, address uh, kind of um, helping them. Probably, I'm assuming helping them to get to their their true authentic story. So tell us a little bit about um, your journal and why that came about. Yeah, you assume you assume correctly. Um, <laughs> everything that Dr. Johnny was saying is like, oh yeah, this is definitely connected um, to, to what I'm passionate about and what I try to do with the work that I have with my journal. But I think like when we think about um, wellness and access to um, wholeness and healing, I think so much of our identity as black men and especially in the way that is perceived as society like tells us that we can't have access to those things that we need in order to heal um and so i think about the fact that in our ma masculinity that we are told that we can't feel we can't have emotions we're supposed to give this a uh, certain persona off but then also as a black man specifically when i um, exhibit certain emotions namely anger or frustration or anything like that is then deemed as threatening and so it's kind of like this double-edged sword where like, I don't feel like I have space to, to be myself. I don't feel like I have space to be fully um, um, fully myself and fully whole in order to, to do the things that I need to do to heal. But then I think about like the storytelling piece of what um, Dr. Johnny was talking about. So I wrote my journal uh, right um, after the murders of George Floyd, Amart Aubrey, um, Breonna Taylor, the list goes on um, that summer. Um, and I think that uh, one thing that was consist consistently disheartening for me was the fact that after these Black people were killed, 
Um, their stories were kind of relegated to hashtags. And then the narratives were then created by the media uh, rather than um, allowing the, the people to, uh, to kind of the stories and the lives of the people to actually speak for themselves. Um, and so I think when I wrote this journal, I, I wanted space um, for myself and, and my brothers and people that I knew, uh, specifically Black men that I knew, to be able to uh, not only identify and uh, understand their emotions, but also like reclaim the narrative of their lives um, and understand their identity as a Black man as, the, as it showed up for them. Um, and so I was looking online for a journal for Black men and I didn't find a lot. <laughs> and so I was like, well, uh, maybe I'll try to figure out something. Um, and so, yeah, that's where this came from. But yeah, I think definitely around a piece of allowing Black men to to have that space to 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 create their own story or to like write their own stories. So then they are in the space where they can access healing, they can access wholeness. Dana, if I can just um, add something sitting on these panel with these three amazing Black men, um, what I think is so important, what even struck me as a, as a mother of a Black son and, and a wife to a Black male husband, um, is what Dr. Parker talked about is understanding your story. But I think there's healing, if you will, and freedom, if you will, and sharing and you telling your story. It's one thing um, I think Dr. Johnny would probably, Dr. Parker would agree, is once you know that, but then you tell it because it's important that you narrate your own story because even once you know who you are, whose you are and what you've been called to do, it's important to kind of put your voice to that. And what I realized is that there's literally a book in all of us. I mean, there are stories that we can tell, there's lessons that we, we've learned, there's affirmations that we can share with others. But what I've learned is that with the trauma that I've experienced, just as we can pass down generational trauma, you can also pass down healing. And I think it's important for us to make sure that we share and tell our stories, um, which is what I have even done during this past year as a frontline worker during this pandemic that is still ensuing. Tell, tell what's happening, let people know, because what I've learned during this process is that the messenger is quite frankly, almost more important than the actual message, because people aren't going to hear the message if they don't believe, trust, or have some connection to whom the messenger is. Yea, I say the political state of our country right now, right? So we won't go there. But I'm just simply stating that it's important to make sure, um, and I loved what Dr. Parker was talking about, that we have to make sure that we pass on those stories. Um, and as a, uh, my mother died when I was four, uh, Dana, and I think about what I've gone through, what caused me, and what my calling was to nursing um, versus being a physician, what caused me to love what I do, because I am that nurturer, server, giving servant person. But I realized that came from my own trauma. So as much as I'm now living this, this amazing life and this great profession that I love so dearly, it literally was birthed out of me because of my own past trauma. And so I want to encourage all of our listeners and viewers today in this platform to be vulnerable. I'm not telling everybody to tell people your FICO score and what your mortgage is and all of that, but the, the, the parts of the story that you can tell and share um, you know, as an unapologetic, unapologetically woman of faith, I believe that the testimony there, it's a test. And so somebody else's healing and deliverance can come from you sharing your story. And so, um, yes, uh, Mr. Muhammad, you can pass down healing as well. So I think it's important to be a little bit vulnerable and share your story because in your sharing, you might help somebody else be comfortable to do the same. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that, Meaty. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about, um, you know, trauma and how that gets passed down. But it's also important to talk about healing and how we can pass down healing as well. Um, and even just starting those conversations, as you all are saying, you know, just being vulnerable and being open, particularly we know in the Black community, we don't often have even conversations about health and mental health. And, you know, um, I was listening to one of the panels earlier and, um, you know, they were talking about, you know, a lot of times we didn't hear our, our grandparents and great grandparents talking about, you know, these issues, even though they were dealing with them, right? And so it's important to be able to, to name it, name what we're feeling, name what we're experiencing, um, and, and really start thinking about these stories and sharing those stories. Uh, I see some comments um, in the chat as well about there's freedom and healing and, and sharing your story and being vulnerable uh, to bring about connection and wholeness. Um, and I know Meaty and, and Brennan, you all have really been you know, on the front lines during this pandemic, um, you know, 
Um, teachers aren't necessarily, haven't always been considered frontline workers, Brennan, but I'm sure after this pandemic, people will probably have a different thought about that. Um, you know, what have you seen just even being in the schools? And I know we talked a little bit about, um, you know, just helping children kind of and helping people, uh, adults kind of name, you know, what they're feeling. Um, certainly children have been going through a lot in the middle of this pandemic. And as they're, you know, trying to get back into school, um, you know, what have you observed? Now you do a lot of social emotional wellness coaching as well at school. So what um, thoughts or advice do you have for people who are trying to support their young children in this process right now? Yeah, um, I think so. I taught I was still a teacher during the during the height of the pandemic and we were virtual and things like that. And so I thought that was the hardest year that I've ever experienced as, a, as an educator. But this year has definitely proved to be harder. And I think that coming back from virtual learning um, and all the things that our kids have been exposed to um, has just made it a lot more difficult. Um, I think in my first couple of weeks of, of this role, um, I was doing check-ins with students and almost every student had lost someone in the last year from either COVID or gun violence. Um, and it was just showing up in all of the ways. Um, it was showing up as misbehavior, but you dig deeper and you dig deeper and you see that it's just um, the way that they're responding to the trauma in their life. Um, and so I think that um, in ways we're figuring out how to, to deal, how to support and um, educate in a, a fundamentally different world in a lot of ways. Um, but I think that uh, the biggest thing is one thing we do every day uh, with our students um, is we have a specific advisory period, but the thing, first thing that they do is they check in. Um, and it's a space where they're able to say, I feel this way because. Um, and sometimes it's, I feel, I feel upset because I didn't get my lunch today or I didn't get what I wanted at lunch today. But sometimes it, it, it gets deeper um, and it allows us um, as teachers, it allows us as leaders um, to, to have those checkpoints. And so I think that uh, as much as you can very simply ask your kids, whether it's your kids or if you deal with kids you are around youth, like, how are you feeling? And then you listen. Um, I think that that is important because I think more than anything, uh, what I tell my staff is our kids want to uh, to feel seen, they want to feel known, and they want to feel loved. And I think that that is uh, a very like practical way to do that on a daily basis. Absolutely. I love that. Um, making sure our kids feel seen and heard and known, feel loved. Um, really checking in and giving them space to um, acknowledge their feelings, talk about how they're feeling um, and why. Just making that normative, right? Um, giving them the space to do that. Um, uh, oh, you asked your son that media. I love that question. What's the best and worst part of your day? Uh, okay, I see we are... This conversation is so good. I wish I could talk to you all all day. Um, <laughs> I feel like we're just getting started. Um, oh, I love that comment as well. We have to break away from the silence we have cultivated in our community. Yes, open up conversation. Hey, Dana, um, we have to ask Dr. Parker the O-R-Y. He gave us the S-T. Somebody put it in the chat. Yes, Dr. Dr. Break Johnny. Down. Parker, break it down. Don't leave the people. Break it down. Okay. Break all right. The O R Y. Sound like yes. a song, right? Okay. So the S was sold. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We can break it down. Go through the bridge, Maceo. All right. Go to school. All right. So O R Y. The uh, so the S is soul. Who am I? What do I want? Why do I want it? Those are the three questions. The T is transparency. That's uh that's our that's that's emotions and and I say particularly to men, but this is true for everyone, in terms of our emotions. Whatever we don't talk out, we will act out, or we will bury the emotion alone. I have three sons, 29, 25, 22. I've been very intentional. I love what Brennan said. I'm a journaler, and I've created a journal, turn the page journal, and I encourage my students and I encourage everyone I, I coach to write down three gratitudes every day because when you do gratitude is a mood booster. Serotonin levels are impacted. Dopamine levels, pleasure centers in your brain. So the O is optimism. You want to have a mindset of 1% better. All right. Growth, growth is not a big gulp. Growth is a sip. Growth is you, you take sips. OK, so you want to have a mindset 1 percent better, 1 percent better spiritually, 1 percent better physically, 1 percent better emotionally, relationally, mentally, 
financially, 1% better. That's the O. R is rhythm. Life is not a balance. Life is life work rhythm, not life work balance. There's no such thing. Midi works with hearts <laughs> um, in cardiology. The heart doesn't have a balance. The heart has a rhythm. The ocean doesn't have a balance. Ocean has a rhythm. The seasons have a rhythm. So we got to understand that it's a rhythm, and that rhythm is is three R's. It's reflect, refresh, and recenter. We need to be very intentional about times to reflect, looking at our day. Uh, what gave you life today? Um, refresh. What's your self care habit? What's self care for you? And then recenter. You always want to come back to the core values. And for me, as a man of faith, it starts with God. It's my it's my faith. And then. So that's that. That's the R. It's rhythm. Life is a rhythm, not a balance. And then the Y is yield. You for to live a life of flourishing, you yield to something bigger, something greater, someone bigger than yourself. That's where faith comes in. And, and we have, you know, your, it, you know, I honor your faith, your your faith tradition. Mine is, you know, I'm, I'm a believer in Christ, Jesus Christ. And that's my that's my faith. Tradition. I'm also I'm a licensed minister, a spiritual advisor. And so um, so that shapes my story. You know, I look at my my faith as really the author of my story is my my faith. So those that's 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 the story. That's the process. And um, that we walk people through. Yeah, somebody got it. Ariel, you good. Thank oh you, Ariel. You got that thing. <laughs> yeah, that's it. And that's in my book. That's in my book. You can see it behind me. It's in my book, Turn the Page, Unlocking the Story Within You. Um, and, and we walk you through that process. And we and again, it's important that we hear this. And I'll say this. Be, click, be, be aware that your backstage is only intended to sustain and empower the good stuff you're doing on the front stage. Many people falter because they have a poorly developed backstage and they're burning out. When men get to be 40 in their 40s, it's the most challenging decade in a man's life. Um, testosterone levels go down. He can't get erections anymore. I mean, we're getting the real, right? I mean, he's struggling with that. So you got to get some blue chews or some Cialis. But he ain't talking about that. He's losing his hair. He's losing muscle mass. And so I know men who've cheated on their wives just to see if they can still get something going. Mm. That's the kind of stuff that um, that the decade, the different decades in a man's life, woman's life. But I'm just, I just, I just mentioned that because I, I see we, you know, just just for the men that are listening. But um, but anyway, it's just understanding the relationship between your front stage performance and productivity, but your backstage got to be grounded in this good stuff of the story to sustain what you're trying to become, what you're trying to do on the front stage. Ooh, I was taking all kinds of notes over here, Dr. Johnny. That was good. I'm glad we got, thank you, Meaty, for pointing out, you too. <laughs> thank you for pointing out we needed the rest of those, the uh, rest of the story to figure out how to get it done. Um, and I can't see our, our Q&A. Are there other questions um, in our Q&A that participants had for our panels? I did see one earlier. Um, that said, what health advantages do we as black people have? Um, not sure if any of you, okay. I, you know what? I'm not sure, um, but I, I'll take a quick little stab. The first one, quite frankly, um, and I'm leaning back on my um, brother that was talking earlier from here, is we're just a very resilient people, uh, quite frankly. I think whether that's genetic, whether it's emotional, whether it's meant, whatever it is, um, African-Americans in particular are very, very, very resilient people. I, I, I choose to believe, again, this is not scientific, uh, scientific fact, but I just really choose to believe that we have a resilience gene because when I look back and, you know, the old church saying, uh, Dr. Park, when I look back over, over my life and wonder how I got over, I'm like, we talk about slavery. I'm just talking about the middle passage. Can we just talk about that. And so when I wonder and think about how my ancestors survived that to then endure what they've endured um, is amazing. And so I think as African Americans, we have a very strong work ethic. I think it's important of uh, the narratives that we tell. Um, I don't think that we have any more or less health disparities the health disparities and inequities that we do experience are because of access. Um, because of social economic status, because of the um, unintentional, sometimes intentional um, discrimination that we uh, face 
in the middle of, of healthcare in particular. Um, we've heard all about it, particularly during this pandemic where it's been illuminated again about the vaccine hesitancy, et cetera. Um, again, wherever you are in that spectrum, I'm not here to, to preach to you, but what I will say is that it's important that Blacks Black folks in particular have an absolute um, right and, and a reason to ensure that uh, they have a little bit of a hesitancy when it comes to the medical, traditional medical establishment here in the U.S. And so um, having that um, healthy skepticism is good to some extent, but I think it's important. Again, that's why you find people who um, look like you whose message you can believe and have some faith and trust in uh, to move forward. And so um, I don't know if there's any specific health advantage that we have. Um, I'm not necessarily aware of that um, because all groups, whether Caucasian, whether you're Indian, whether you're from the Caribbean, whether you're uh, Latino, et cetera, we all have different um, health issues uh, based upon, you know, geographic sometimes and also based on our social economic statuses. Okay. Thank you, Meedy. I see there was another question. How do we embed healing in our community without destroying our culture? So, for example, soul food. I think that's a, a pretty easy solution. One, you don't have to take out the things that we enjoy. You just have to do things in moderation. So Dr. Dr. Johnny was talking about, uh, you know, our projected self. A lot of us don't have a good base, you know, our base reality. We think we are projected self because our projected self gives us a good feeling about ourselves. So this is how we do with our emotions. I, I call it that we you need to remove the middleman to your emotions. The middleman to your emotions is, is capitalism and consumerism. You know, if you, if, if you want to feel better, you should go buy this. You should go have this. You should go eat this. You go sex this. You, could, you can keep going down the line, line, line. So then we get to the point where now we're over drinking, over sexing, over, over consuming foods that are not healthy for us. I mean, me, I eat whatever I want. And that sounds like, oh, well, he must eat Twinkies all day or something like that. No, I eat what I want. But if you look at what the basis is that I eat, I'm able to eat what I want because I don't eat like I don't eat quote unquote bad foods you know, or uh, unhealthy food. So I think it's just all about moderation. I mean, we got to start looking at all the things that we have in this earth as just simply our resources. They're not good or bad. The only thing that makes something good or bad is the consciousness that wields it. Mm -hmm. So you can, water can give you life or it can drown you. So even with the internet, internet is not good or bad. It's how you use, you choose to use it. So I opened up uh inception where i opened my first business in 2007 was called neuro fitness center it was me and my dad i'm a kid from eight mile i never went to school for psychology or neurology how did i get all this information the internet it's in a pocket i read it i did my work that's one I did my own work right so that's the tool all these things are tools in our community hip-hop i got a song with Razzcast now legendary west coast rapper uh, one of Dr. Dre's top five rappers. I got a hip hop song with them, bringing what it feels like to do real, talk about real mental health into a song. Like we can use these tools. All of these things, again, are just tools. So we don't have to take the coolness out of it, the essence out of it to use it. We just not need to know how, what's the resourceful way to use what we have. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, so I see, I think we have one minute left. Uh, I'm just gonna go back to each of our panelists, give you an opportunity to share any closing remarks. And if you also want to let um, our viewers know where they can find you or more about your resources that you have, um, you can do that. So I'll start with Brennan. Yes, thanks again uh, for, for having me. This is a very enriching session even for me. Um, I have like, all these notes on my paper right here. So I'm really excited um, I, to find what we're doing. Uh, I have an Instagram at Breathe Brother. Um, it's spelled right here, B-R-O-T-H-A, um, at Breathe Brother. And then also you can find uh, my journal, Breathe, a guided healing journal for Black men on Amazon and pretty much any online bookstore. Um, if you're in the DC, Baltimore area, uh, we are in the book of, brick and mortar shop of um, Nubian human. Um, and so 
uh, yeah, that's where you can find me. All right. Thank you, Brennan. All right. Meaty, final thoughts? Health is the greatest wealth asset that you have. Make sure you take care of yourself because who you need to be the best version of you so you can live out the full potential that God has inside of you. And if you have not birthed that out yet, take the time to do so because that baby's waiting to, to be here. Um, my name is Nurse Meaty Bartonelli. Thank you so very much for having me. Um, you can find me on social media platforms, IG at Nurse Meaty B, Facebook Meaty Bartonelli. And also wanted to let you all know, um, Athea Wellness Solutions is also on um, a new LLC that we formed that you mentioned. And so you can find me. There's not many meaty Bartonellis out there. So I'm just happy to be here and make sure you take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thank you so much. All right, David, final thoughts? Yeah, that, that question popped up again about our uh what are our advantages and that that's going to end my closing um, our advantages is one we've been under a amount of a, a considerable amount of stress and trauma generally generationally for periods of time right so with that energy being in our bodies that's what happens when we go into these fight or flight freeze responses so that creates this post-traumatic stress that's in us and that can be seen as a negative but the truth is that that energy that's present in you can actually be used for transformation to move from post-traumatic stress to post-traumatic growth. So that's a real gift and being able to use that energy that's within us to, to elevate ourselves. We're all geniuses. We just need to be able to convert that energy and that uh, to, to what we're supposed to do in our passion, our, our purpose. So you can find me at uh, inceptionep.com and you can also find us on IG. I do a lot of education and talking on there at Mr. David McCullough. Uh, M-C-C-U-L-L-A-R. All right. Thank you so much. All right, Dr. Johnny, final words and thoughts. Wow. First, it's been it's been a joy to be with Meaty, Brennan, David, and Dana. It's been really, what a great way to spend Saturday afternoon other than watching college football, which I love sports. Hey, um, you know what? It's it's encourage it's encouraging that we're having these conversations. So uh, so uh, and, and you can I have a resource. I just put it out there. Uh, you can go to johnnyparker.com. Rise and Rise is a tool that I created in the pandemic, and it's an acronym, and it stands for R Robust I Impact S Seek and Effect. And so it's a great tool. Like when you get to that part about the, we ask about your strength. So it's a strengths piece connected to that. And we, we give a real practical exercise we call backcasting, where we have you write a letter to your future as if you've achieved it. And that's part of the rise. So it's, 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 um, it's part of the positive psychology of grit, which is passion and perseverance of a long period of time. And uh, resilience, when you bounce back from a setback, better, wiser, stronger. So that is that is shaped and inspired by grit and uh, resilience. And then you can go to johnnyparker.com and there's a gift I give people and it's a gratitude advantage. I encourage the next 21 days, you get that one and you have a 21 day gratitude advantage. You can talk it, you can record it, you can sing it like what David was talking, whatever way. We just want you to be intentional. As I said earlier, we don't bump into better, we don't wander to wellness. Wellness is hard work, wellness is heart work, wellness is worth the work. And today we can continue to do that work. Love that, wellness is worth the work, amen. Whew, all right. This session was just so fulfilling. Um, learned so much. So many wonderful tools and jewels that were dropped. I saw somebody said in the chat they're going to have to definitely view this recording again uh, to get all of the tips that were shared. This was amazing. Um, I just want to thank you all for joining us. I want to thank all of our panelists who have been part of our Black Mental Wellness Conference, our vendors. Um, please do go check them out as well. Um, and all the volunteers, you all have been amazing in helping us um, to really get the conference off to an amazing start and, and keep everything going. Um, so yes, all of the sessions are recorded. You will be able to receive the recordings um, within a few days following the conference. Um, we just really appreciate all of you for taking time out of your day to spend with us. Uh, we appreciate it and we look forward to seeing you all next year. Thank you all so much. Bye-bye.